Okay, here we go. So um, as I just said, um, good evening, everybody. My name is Sarah Nash, and I am here from an organization called Study Options. Um, thank you all very much for coming along this evening and um, tuning in. I appreciate your time. Um, I would like to talk to you about um, the option of studying in Australia and New Zealand this evening. Um, so Study Options is an organisation that is funded by Australian and New Zealand uni um, universities to help students um, through the application process on their behalf. Um, we are the UK and in some cases the European office um, for a large number of different um, Australian and New Zealand universities, including, for example, the University of Melbourne, the University of Sydney, um, ANU, the University of Queensland and many, many more. So um, altogether, we um, represent um, over 30 different universities universities in Australia and New Zealand. Um, the service that we provide um, is very much, I guess, like similar to that of UCAS for uh, UK applications. So we provide a lot of course um, advice, university destination counselling to help, <coughs> excuse me, a student decide uh, which universities and courses they would like to apply to. But we also actually handle the applications made from UK and UK based students. So that means that if someone does want to move forward with an application, they would send those applications to our office in um, the UK, our head office is in Bristol, um, and we would then liaise with our colleagues on the relevant um, admissions teams to get those applications assessed. Okay. So just a quick sort of overview of what I want to do tonight. Now, I know we only have half an hour um, and I am really notorious for overrunning on presentations. I will hold my hand up to that straight away. But what I'd really like to do is give you guys an overview um, of Australia and New Zealand um, as a university destination, as an option. So obviously um, students these days just have so much choice, which is fantastic. Um, you know, so many opportunities all over the world and different countries do um, offer very different opportunities when it comes to university education. So not just in the sense of the different ways in which they teach um, or train in different professions or teach different disciplines, but also um, the overall student environment that they offer, the campus environment that they offer. Um, so I just want to kind of outline really what some of the key points of difference might be um, about Australia and New Zealand and perhaps how this compares to say um, universities in the UK um, and universities for example in America which some of you may also be um, looking for information on. So um, I am just going to um, share my screen so bear with me. Um, so hopefully Hopefully now you can all see um, a uh, fairly basic PDF. Uh, apologies, my, um, my PowerPoint was misbehaving this evening. So I thought I'd go for the, um, the old fashioned um, approach to uh, presentations. Um, but yeah, so this really um, is just, again, reiterating um, the number of ways in which we can help students um, who are interested in this as an option. Um, and the one thing I'd really like to stress here is that study options is a completely free service for students and schools and families. So um, as I said, all all of our funding comes from uh, universities in Australia and New Zealand. So um, there's no charge at all at any stage of the process in any of the help that we offer to um, students. Um, our website is up there um, on the uh, first slide. And if anybody would like more information, there is tons and tons and tons of information. So university profiles, um, general overviews, location um, information up there um, on our website. So um, I would encourage you all to have a look at that. Um, okay, first of all, just to kind of kick things off, can I get an idea of, of how many people are sort of familiar with Australia and New Zealand as a destination? Um, are, are you guys able to raise your hands or, or um, show if you have actually visited um, either country? I don't know if we can um, show this in somehow in the chat. Um, and do we have anybody here this evening who is a citizen of Australia or New Zealand? Okay, okay, right, that is really helpful uh, for me to know um, because different application procedures apply depending on whether somebody is an international student in Australia. So international student in Australia and New Zealand simply means that you are a citizen of either country. So that's what we would call a domestic student. Um, anybody who is not a citizen of Australia and New Zealand is an international student. So there's literally only two classifications of students in both countries. 
Um, okay, so to kick things off, I've just put um, a couple of pictures here really, so set the scene if you like. Um, so this first one is of um, UNSW Sydney, which is um, one of the group of eight universities in Australia. So the group of eight is uh, very similar to the Russell Group here in the UK, or perhaps the Ivy League in the US. Um, so these are the universities you will generally see sort of um, highest ranked um, in the international tables, and um, they are located all over the country. Um, I would really sort of stress though that um, whilst these universities are all top 100 in the world universities, very prestigious in that sense, but there are also other universities in Australia and New Zealand which have real um, expertise, real depth, real excellence um, in particular areas as well. So um, I would always personally encourage a student to check individual subject rankings as well as overall rankings. Um, you can see um, from this picture versus the next picture that the uh, universities in Australia and New Zealand vary in terms of their looks, um, pretty much just as much as, a, as uh, the universities do here in the UK. So you have the full sort of uh, range, as it were, from quite modern campuses. So UNSW Sydney founded in the late 1950s, um, very modern looking, um, to something that um, I would describe as a very traditional sort of what we call the sandstone universities, um, which is kind of a good example is the University of Adelaide, which is the picture here on your screen at the moment. Okay, so moving quickly ahead. So the first thing I want to sort of really stress is when you look at Australia and New Zealand as a potential destination for your university studies, just be aware that even though you are going about as far away geographically as it is possible to go from the UK, um, actually the experience of being a student in either of these countries is, is really not dissimilar to being in the UK. And that's because both Australia and New Zealand have education models, um, sorry, systems that are based on the model that we use here in the UK. Um, now that has some uh, real advantages, real practical advantages, um, not least that it makes it very straightforward to move from a UK school into an Australian or New Zealand university. So you're looking at very much moving from like to like. So in terms of the application process, and I'll come on to this in a little more depth later on, um, you are going to be applying using your forecast grades, um, either at A-level or IB, um, and the universities are going to assess you on those. So they're not going to ask you to take lots of additional um, aptitude tests. So unlike America, there's no need for things like the, um, the SATs or the ACT. Um, and you're not going to be asked to do lots and lots of, for example, additional essay work either. So it is um, much more uh, similar to the UCAS application process than it is to some of the other international systems that you may be considering. Um, another really important um, sort of advantage to the similarities between the system is that there's very, very strong degree recognition for Australian and New Zealand qualifications um, back here in the UK, as well as in many other countries in the world as well. Um, now, I also mean when I say um, excellent recognition, that there's excellent recognition of professional qualifications as well as general degrees. So by that, I mean, um, if you train as a doctor, in Australia or New Zealand, that qualification is valid here in the UK, just as it is if you train as a social worker, an engineer, a dentist, a teacher, and so on and so on and so on. So in many, many um, instances, the uh, professional regulatory bodies of different, um, different professions have actually sort of, you know, got together and, and recognised the qualifications that are taught in the opposite numbers country really good example of that is engineering. Engineering is a very well organized profession um, and so if you take the recognized qualification for professional engineering in Australia and New Zealand you can use that to work immediately in the UK as well as in the US, in Canada, huge number of other countries. Um, vets, vets are also very well organized professionally so the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons here in the UK has actually um, individually um, assessed and recognise all of the vet science programmes that are taught at our partner universities in Australia and New Zealand. So that means, again, you can get that professional qualification and come straight back to the UK to work. So it's going to be instantly recognised, which is really, really important. Um, and there is a huge, huge number um, of degrees available, a huge, huge number of subjects, hundreds of different degree subjects. Um, I have yet to find a subject that's offered in the UK that is not taught somewhere in Australia and New Zealand, although I'm sure there's first time for people. Um, okay, moving along though, 
I wanted to stress something that I think is a really important point of difference when you look at studying in Australia and New Zealand. And that's this, it's the, it's the actual structure of an undergraduate degree. Um, so our degrees um, in the UK tend to be very narrow in their subject focus. So by that, I mean, if you enroll on a history degree, for example, you will be studying history for three years. Um, in Australia and New Zealand, you don't apply to the subject, you apply to the degree. So you would be doing a Bachelor of Arts and then you would declare your major as history. So history is still going to be the subject that's written on your degree certificate. That's what you're going to be a graduate of. However, when you enroll on your program, as you can see from the diagram, you're going to be taking um, subjects in your declared major. So that's the kind of uh, the darker blue blocks that you see here in front of you. But once you've met all the required sort of standards for your major, we call this um, satisfying the requirements of your major, you then have the opportunity to take elective courses in another subject or other subjects, plural, um, from the faculty. So for example, if I'm a history student, I might want to take some papers in things like economics, maybe politics, international relations, or I might just want to do something because I love it and I, I want to you know, study it at university. So I might want to take a creative writing paper, for example. So this structure really offers students the chance to, to create a degree that's quite unique to them and to their career goals. Um, and also obviously to their academic strengths as well. So um, interestingly, a study options has been running since 2005. And when we stay in touch with our undergraduate students and ask them, you know, what was the key thing that made you study in Australia or New Zealand rather than, than remaining in the UK for your, your degree? This degree structure, this broader, more flexible um, structure is always the thing that is top of the list. So this gives people the opportunity to try different subjects and you know, receive a much broader um, education, which in turn, our universities would argue, um, means that they're much better positioned to sort of take advantages, um, take advantage of some of the opportunities that might come their way professionally later in life, and also deal with the challenges that they might encounter with their career as well. So it's a, it's, it's a very important difference, I think, to be aware of. Another thing that, that may um, appeal to some students um, is that your, um, your workload in Australia and New Zealand is much more evenly split over the three years of your programme than it is, again, for example, here in the UK. So in the UK, um, your first year of university study actually doesn't count towards the um, final classification of your degree. So instead, you simply need to pass it and be able to move forward into second year. Um, in Australia or New Zealand, your marks count from day one of year one. So everything that you do whilst you're at university counts towards your final degree mark. Um, now, going back to the UK again, you'll normally find so 0% goes on first year, then about 30% on second year, and usually a huge 70% of somebody's mark rests on their performance during their final year of study. Um, so some people really thrive under that pressure. They're really happy with that. But if you're a student who actually doesn't really relish having certain, like no work or very little work, I should say, in first year, and then suddenly a whole lot of work and a whole lot of pressure falling on you in just one year, then it might be sort of worth considering some of those other international destinations, including Australia and New Zealand. So our universities would structure things as 30% goes on first year, 30% goes on second year, and then 40% goes on third year. So it's a far more even split, far more even split of pressure, far more even split of workload. Okay, so the next point that I wanted to, um, oh, sorry, I just skipped ahead of slide. Um, I should stress that that um, degree structure that I just showed you, that does only apply to what we would call the general degrees. So by that, I mean Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Commerce, Bachelor of Science. Um, if you want to study a professional program, for example, engineering, law, medicine, teaching, then you don't get as many chances, um, if any, in some cases, to take elective study. Um, instead, you must follow the set structured study pattern um, that the, the, the profession has dictated that you need in order to qualify. So that, that is a difference to be aware of. Okay, um, moving on. Um, the next thing I think that is worth being aware of is that the teaching culture is slightly different in Australia and New Zealand, again, to the UK. Um, so 
very, very strong emphasis is placed um, on the importance of undergraduate and postgraduate teaching. Um, from a student's perspective, what that really means in practice is that you're going to have higher contact teaching hours than you typically would in the UK. So again, this is really a question I think that students need to ask themselves, um, you know, are you somebody who relishes that very independent self directed learning model that you tend to find in the UK, where it's very much down to the student to go off and, you know, go to the library and get the work done by themselves? Or are you somebody who would much rather have more contact teaching, um, sorry, more contact with your, um, your teachers, academics, and also your fellow students as well? So again, it's really a case of trying to find the best fit for each student to make sure that you're in a situation where you can really thrive um, and, and achieve at the best possible level. Um, our universities offer a huge number of opportunities for students um, outside of the classroom. So um, again, I think this is an important question for students to ask themselves, you know, what would you like to have access to when you're not studying? You know, is it very important to you, for example, to have access to a particular type of sports club? Um, you know, in that case, it's important to think, well, where in the world is that sport, you know, offered? Where is it played? Um, similarly, if you're really, really um, into, for example, um, drama, you want to have access to a drama club, a very active drama club, you know, again, that's something that's worth kind of thinking about in terms of the best location for you. Um, the other thing that I always encourage students to consider as well is where would you like to live whilst you study? Um, you know, obviously being an undergraduate student somewhere is it's a it's a very formative time in anybody's life. And it does mean committing to a country or to a location for three, four or even maybe five years, depending on the degree that somebody is studying. So I always sort of think, well, you know, what does somebody want to have access to what do they want to have to do in their spare time? when they're not studying. So um, you can see the picture to the, um, to the top left hand side of your screen there. So this is the Southern Alps um, in New Zealand. Um, so we have sent over the years, we have sent a large number of students to study in the South Island because they're really into their snow sports. And so if you study at either the University of Canterbury or the University of Otago, it's entirely feasible to go skiing or snowboarding pretty much every single weekend um, of the season. Um, both sports are far more affordable than they typically are um, in Europe. And so we do have a number of students who would think it completely normal to pack up their car with some friends on a Friday afternoon and just head up to the mountains for the weekend um, for pretty much the whole of the winter season. So again, if that's something that, that you would like to have access to, think about, well, which country will make that a reality for you? Um, where will you be able to do that? So maybe if, if you are a, a real um, a ski or snowboard enthusiast, maybe you might want to think about Canada, for example, but also I would encourage you to think about New Zealand as well. Um, the other thing that we always um, find is that we do send a lot of um, keen student athletes to study in Australia and New Zealand. Um, the sporting facilities offered by our universities are really, really very impressive, um, not least um, swimming pools. So um, we have an image here because I always think it's quite ironic. Most, most of our um, Australian universities in particular have what they call 50 metre lap pools mm -hmm. on campus. Now, you and I would, would probably know them better as Olympic sized swimming pools, which are actually very, very rare in the UK. We only have um, a, a relatively small number, I believe it's around 10 to 15, um, and the UK has around 120 or over 120 universities, um, whereas, as said, the Australian universities think that these are very, very, very commonplace, um, to the point that they don't even, in my opinion, really advertise them properly by referring to them as a lap pool rather than an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Um, okay, so now I've, I've put this picture of shame, fairly shameless uh, picture of Melbourne um, up here um, because I did also want to stress that many people think that Australia and New Zealand is only for people who love the great outdoors. And that's, you know, really, really not the case. These uh, countries are home to some really beautiful, exciting, vibrant cities. Um, Melbourne is my personal favorite, but there are many, many other examples um, and amazing destinations, made amazing student cities. Okay, um, accommodation. So I'm going to come on to a couple of the practicalities now because true to form, I think I'm probably running out of time. Um, a couple of the practicalities and really all I wanted to stress on the accommodation side of things is that this is very much something that study options is responsible for helping students with. So we are very, very keen to always ensure that a new undergraduate student 
has university managed or university run accommodation in place um, way before they leave their home. Um, so that is something that we tend to sort of really, really push with students, make sure they do everything by the deadlines um, and try to get their first choice accommodation in place as early as possible. Um, there's lots of information again about these different options up on our website. Um, leaning on really from uh, accommodation, I also wanted to stress that um, each of these universities um, or our partner universities in Australia and New Zealand has really excellent uh, pastoral support services. Um, this is just a short list um, of some of the things that they offer, but really the, uh, the key thing I think is that students should know that there's always help there, there's always support there, um, and usually the best place to go to find it um, is the International Student Office. So they can go in to one very, very easy, um, easily find, sorry, easy to find place um, and get support for whatever issue it is that they are having problems with. Okay, so just want to move on now um, to some real practicalities costs. So how much does it cost to study in Australia and New Zealand? Now, um, I would stress here that what I'm about to say is, is relevant to international students rather than to citizens. Um, but when you're an international student, the key thing to know is that each university sets its own tuition fees for each course. So there's a lot of variation um, and students really need to get their heads around that. So you'll find that, for example, the Bachelor of Arts at the University of Sydney is priced completely differently to the Bachelor of Arts at the University of Melbourne. So we do really, really stress that people need to look at that, factor that into their decision making about where they might want to apply or where they might want to accept um, as early as possible. Um, any funding that a student is eligible for from the states of Jersey can be used towards study anywhere in the world. So that's definitely um, sort of an option that Jersey students can look at that other students can't, which is fantastic. Um, and the other thing I want to stress here is that we are seeing more undergraduate scholarships coming on stream at the moment from our partner universities, which is really exciting that that really hasn't been the case until about sort of three, four years ago. Um, but now several of our university partners are offering academic excellence scholarships. Um, so those can be, uh, they usually take the form of a reduction in tuition fees, a percentage reduction in tuition fees. Um, and again, study options, we're really happy to advise students on what might be the best fit or the best um, a scholarship for them to consider. Okay, so in terms of how to apply, so as I mentioned at the beginning of uh, the presentation, applications are made through study options and not via UCAS. Um, it's a very straightforward process. So the only time that students would be asked for additional material is if they're applying for um, a clinical program such as medicine or dentistry, um, or a program that is uh, talent based, um, such as music performance um, or fine art, for example. Um, but when a student contacts us, we would be very clear um, in terms of what, if anything, they had to provide that was additional to the standard list. Um, students apply during their final year of school for conditional offers of place. So the application deadline, if you're going down that route, is to have your applications to study options by the end of April of upper sixth year. The reason that we give that as a deadline is because we usually find that we have to balance the uh, demands of UCAS, the timeframes that UCAS put in place, and the timeframes that our universities put in place. So the goal here is to have students holding conditional offers within both systems, and then once they have their final grades, they can choose which one they want to go forward with um, and, and accept. Okay. Um, and that is all the information I think I wanted to, to um, give you guys at this point. Um, if anyone would like more information or would like to really explore this as an option, I'd really encourage you to request a course list from us. You can do that by the website. The URL is just up there on your screens. Um, so what we would do is we would ask a student to give us some details about what they're interested in studying, um, what their current qualifications are. Um, and then we would send out a list of all of the degrees that are available in their chosen subject. So um, that's really an opportunity to go through. The entry requirements are given on our course list in terms of A-levels. Um, we also provide annual tuition fee information as well as course content and structure. So they really are very, very helpful sort of like summaries, if you like, from which to kind of kick off your research um, into the other things that are available. 
Okay, so our contact details are up there. Um, and so please do make sure that, that you ask us lots of questions, um, you know, as many, as many as you can think of. We are a free resource for students and we are funded by the universities to provide help on their behalf. Okay, so I'm just gonna stop um, sharing my screen um, now. And I'm just gonna end the recording. So then if you guys have any questions that you'd like to ask, I'd, I'd be really happy to um, answer those. So I'm just gonna stop.